I thank you, God, that we will dig around till we've embraced every move of God, Lord. We will not limit ourselves to our revelation of God. I thank you, God, that we'll pull out of the kingdom things old and new like a wise man, and we'll use them all, God. Thank you for every anointing that you've ever placed on the earth. Thank you for the holiness people, Lord, the people that were holiness people, lived holy lives, God. Thank you for people that had modeled reverence and not just familiarity, but they had a reverence for God and understood that you were sovereign. Thank you, God, for all the different revelations. You're so big, it's going to take eternity for us to know you. But we honor you. We call you Master, Savior. We bless you this morning in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So be it. Give God a hand clap this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You may be seated. One thing this music's taught me is uh, old depends on how old you are, what's old. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? What's old to you might be old as, uh, might not be something somebody else knows about. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I have to admit, I, I enjoyed the moves of God and all the different ones. I enjoyed all the songs that we've sang over the years. But I really, really enjoyed my salvation. When I got born again, it was, um, uh, as crazy as it was, I had a conversion. I didn't have a salvation. I got converted. And I was so excited about God, I really could never shut up talking about him. And I would talk to anybody who would let me talk to him until I wore him out. And then I'd go find somebody else. Uh, my salvation was a reality to me. And it was important to me. I mean, I, it, it was definitely something happening inside of me that I could not explain. And it changed my life forever. It changed how I think. And a lot of times when I think of the old music, you know, I think of those experiences. Uh, how many of you are, are familiar when you go back far enough to Jack Coe and A.A. Allen and all those old evangelists of the 50s that sang all those songs. See, that's, that's not known. I didn't get very many hands. But there's a facet of God uh, during that time that was revealed that God was the healer and God saved and healed at the same time. And people would drive and come from miles and miles around. It wasn't convenient. And they would be excited to go to those meetings because their expectations were very high. And those, those men and women walked in a high level of anointing for that season. They were, it was evangelistic time. And with evangelism, there's always signs, wonders, and miracles. And I, sometimes I think we have gotten so comfortable with God. You know, America is such a blessed country that, that uh, you, you know, you might not have to believe God sometime because you already got stuff. But those people came out of the Depression. Those of you who aren't familiar with the Depression... Everybody's heard about it, but when you come out of, they came out of that, I imagine when they got to know God in another arena, it was very, very important because they just come out of World War II. And uh, I'm, I was told by my dad that when they came home, when the soldiers came home, they had to wait for everything to be converted because they couldn't buy anything that was made out of metal. There was no stoves, there was no refrigerators because all the metal that they were gathering went into uh, military equipment and then they had to convert all the factories back because they converted all those car factories into tank making and jeep making factories and even when they got home after the war things weren't what they, they, they didn't have everything they needed but they were just so glad to be home that they were grateful my, I remember my father said he couldn't get bricks for the house because they didn't have any, there wasn't any to buy and see, we don't know anything about those things. And when you, when you have experiences like that, it changes you. Experiences change you. And uh, it's hard to impart, I don't want to sound like a guy that said, we ate dirt when we went to school and we walked uphill both ways and we was glad to do it. But, you know, you can, 
that was a reality almost at one time that that uh, people didn't have things. And I remember the preachers stories you know my, my father would tell me that the preachers would go and buy shoes for the kids and clothes so they had something to wear in in that season that the, the, the church was paid attention to the needs of the people and uh, it sounds funny but the doctors used to treat you for free and if you got to pay them it was good how many of you know you understand what I'm saying how many of you had a local doctor near the in the neighborhood that worked out of his house that took care of you? whoever came and you know it worked out so we we have lived in such abundance that all of that isn't a reality anymore and all of those things produce gratitude when you get something you're glad to have it That's right. and because of the abundance of all things i don't think we remember sometime how much people went through so we can have this abundance it was paid for with lives it was paid for tremendously uh, and I, I don't know about you but I, I study things till I understand how they work I, I have to figure things out I watched a uh, video clips on the depression because I wanted to understand it and I learned so much that it made me want to learn more and I'm not trying to have a depression I'm just telling you it's good for you to know history because when you steal history you, you steal where everything came from and if you don't tell people about history, they don't even know what to be thankful for. Uh, I don't know, I'm not that much of understanding great economy, but I, I saw in the video, they showed the farmers dumping huge cans of milk out. And their people were hungry in other parts of the country, and the farmers were dumping all that milk in the field because it was cost too much to ship it, and they would have lost money if they did it, so they dumped it all out. Now, that's, that's what happens when you have weird economic failures and cra you do crazy things because nothing makes sense. And see, we, don't, we, we haven't had any of that. Right. We don't know anything about that where nothing is logical and you're just trying to survive. And uh, I remember hearing stories of people stealing pies out of people's windows, you know, while they was cooling off. You laugh, but that's what they did. You'd be surprised what you'd do if you was really, really hungry or really in need or if you had hungry kids at home. Uh, I encourage you sometime to, this is not in a sermon, but it's just a little sermonette, to educate yourself on, on those historical events because I think they would be good for you to know. To know what, you came, what, what people came from, it would help you understand where we're at today. Amen? So, I, I, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you this, preachers, if you're a real one, I'm talking about somebody who wants to communicate, not somebody who wants to preach. Um, I, I can honestly tell you, I'm not even sure I, I, I liked preaching. I just love God, and I love you. So I want to communicate with you to impart you something, not to hear myself talk. I don't need to hear myself talk. I don't really care. My personality was never to do this this way. My personality was to blend in and just service and do things. Uh, I enjoyed my Christian life without being in a, a ministry gift. I was perfectly content being a Christian, perfectly content praying for people, perfectly content helping people get what they need. I used to take stuff to people who didn't have things and I enjoyed every minute of it. So to me, you know, this is okay, but this isn't, this isn't my life. My life is with God. I live over there. Hallelujah. And so this is a responsibility that I take seriously to impart to you things that God wants you to have so you can have a life in Him, that you might know Him, not that you hear me preach. This is all about helping you know God better and have a better life with God. It's, it's not about uh, visible, visible things. Anyway, in, in the book of Ecclesiastics, I'm a back, I even got to back up that, all that statement with Scripture because I love the words so much. I like to be able, if we, if we had time, people, I actually believe that my statements, we could sit down and I could tie you to each, my words to the Scriptures that I'm using, even though I'm not quoting chapter and verse, I could tie you off to the Word because that's how I preach. When I, when I think what I want to say, I always make sure I got a Scripture hooked to each thought. Because I need to tie you off the best I can, right? Don't you want to be tied off? You don't need nobody up here talking and 
not connecting you to truth. That's, that's why you're here. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 9, this is what he said. Well, we'll go to 7, just because you know this and you hear it. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's us, okay? And the spirit shall return to God who gave it. A vanity of vanities, he says, the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Isn't it interesting? We all know we're going to die, but the preacher still got to teach you knowledge, even though we're all limited by time. What you're learning here is eternal. You will take this to heaven with you. The principles are not going to change when you go to heaven. So this is not a waste of time. You're not wasting your time. You're learning eternity here. All you're going to do is move someday and get a new address. But all the, and all the things you're learning in this Bible will be relevant where you're going. You're not going to live in a different principled place. It's all going to be the same. It's a higher life, but it's not going to change the principles. Yea, he gave good heed and, listen to this, and sought out and set in order many pro proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. I will tell you this, if you want to be a good communicator, you literally reach in, in your archives and from other people to find words that you could package so people can receive what you have to say and not feel alienated or misunderstood. It's actually, uh, you have to think about how you're going to communicate to people. Because in today's world, we have all kinds of people. Uh, it's different. Jesus, you know, he, 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 let's face it, he was God. He knew everything. Yet he broke the word down at a very level to, so he could communicate. He wanted to connect. He never talked intelligence so people wouldn't understand. He tried to make it as understandable and palatable as he could. He was the master communicator. Oh, to be like him. Wouldn't you like to be able to communicate with people the way he did and be able to connect them and pull them along? Anyway, uh, the words of the wise are as goads. Now, that would mean that a good preacher has a poker in his tongue because we're sheep and sometimes you got to poke an animal to make it go in the right direction. And have you ever seen an animal when you poke it with a poker? They're not very happy with you. <laughs> it makes them extremely unhappy when you get to poker if you're a shepherd and you're poking people so they go through the right gate. So uh, uh, also that would mean that a preacher's words are not always going to be what you want to hear. They're not always going to be comfortable but he has sought or she has sought out words to help you stay on the right path. Remember, narrow is the way, but wide is the gate that leads to hell, but narrow is the way. You know, it is narrow, and there are absolutes in God. And in a day when we've tried to be appealing to everyone, I don't think you're allowed to lose, lose the integrity of the gospel, the, you know, uh, you you got to let everybody know they're loved and accepted, but you can't compromise the truth because once you begin to compromise the truth, you distort God's image, and they think things are okay that are not, and they start to live lifestyles that are not. You know this, many Christians today think it's okay to live together and get married someday. There's there's so many things that have entered a church that, that are just not biblical. God said that, you know, for this cause, a, a man joins himself to his wife, you know leaves his mother and father and joins him. They're, they're absolutes in God. You're not allowed to condemn people, but you're not allowed to let, lead them to believe it's all right. You know? There's goads that, and, and nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. In other words, when you teach this, when you teach the gospel, I'm telling you, this, you guys that are preachers or wannabes, or, or you have your own sphere of influence that you preach or you tell, because everybody's a preacher in a way. Everybody's an evangelist, everybody's a pastor, and everybody's kind of a preacher, whether you like it or not, that you, you are. You are to your friends, your family. When, when you want to fasten a nail, you take a hammer, if, if you don't have any good stuff, you bend that baby off on the other side of that board so it don't back out, right? Everybody ever done that? I have, didn't have nothing more to bend them babies, they ain't coming out. And that's what he's saying is your nails fastened when you, you hear truths 
you are, the nail is bent off. There are nails that should never back out of your life. There are things that the Word says that will never change. And they should be driven through and bent off on the bottom so you never back out of the truth. Amen. Those of you who built something know what I said. You can make an awful weak structure when things start to, to back out. Sometimes you've got to go back and put bolts in, but we're not, we're not building that kind of stuff today. Uh, anyway, down in verse 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, this is it. When you're done with everything in life and you've studied and you've worked and you've bought and you've sold and you've taught and you've been doing what you do, now, this is Solomon. Solomon, God said he would make Solomon wiser than any man. You remember that? Now, those of you who are Bible readers know that that's what he told him. He said, because you didn't ask me for the, the, your enemies' lives and you didn't ask me for wealth and riches, you asked me for wisdom, I'm going to give you wisdom off the chain, son. So that's who wrote this. He said, let, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, when it's all over, this is the final truth. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know, we, we attach so many things to the gospel. And, and I believe that all of the gospel is true, but you just can't ride one horse and drop all the others. You have to have a, a balanced theology and a balanced teaching. And really, you need to spend time studying yourself because how could anybody put in all the truth in 52 weeks, in 45 minutes? It's God wrote the book. It's eternal. It's huge. You have to invest in your own life to, to, to know what God has to say, too. You have to invest in your life. There has to be an investment. When, you, when God calls you to do something, you have a, requ a requirement to invest yourself into it. And, and try to learn what you need to learn. That's the whole duty of man. For, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. That's scary, isn't it? That means God has a record of all the stuff we've done, good and bad. I hope he loses my paperwork. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, how many of you like some paperwork lost? I'll do it. I don't mind. I'll put my hand up. It is lost. It's under the blood. It went into the sea of forgetfulness, just to let you know. Okay? It's gone. It's gone. If you've repented, see, men bring up your history when they want to hurt you or control you, but God doesn't use that as a weapon. You understand? Now, we, God has principles that cause things to return in your life. But he doesn't use them to damage you. Did you ever fight with somebody and every blow is a blow, blow, blow about your past failures? That's cheating. I always say that's cheating. You're not allowed to do that. You know, you, you got you to gotta keep the, the situation current and relevant in that situation. You do not use people's history to control their behavior. It's really bad. So anyway, with all that said, we're talking about living prepared, you know, preparing your heart. I'm just going to cover some things in the natural. You know, the natural mirrors the spiritual. And in the natural today, you know, you could be called a prepper, right? I mean, they, they even had a show called a prepper. I never got to see it, but I was surfing one day, and, and I saw it. So even preparation has levels. You know that, right? You can't be prepared for everything. It'll take you the rest of your life. And even then, there could be something you didn't cover. You know, when you're a prepper, you must have priorities. Well, you have to have priorities in your Christianity uh, I always say the, the, the things that God wants you to do, you know, is, is feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the fatherless and the widows, and go visit the prisons. If you can get those done, you'd be surprised how happy God's going to be with you. Now, you might not do all the other stuff that gets added on, but those things are close to his heart. And those are the things that are important to God. Anyway, so... You know, if you're going to prepare in a natural, food, water, heat are probably the first three things you should work on, right? You don't have food, you don't have water, and you're not warm, you're in trouble. So that's in the natural prepper. Then, if you wanted to prepare financially, you're supposed to take currency. I call currency paper because it's current, it flows. But money is something else because money retains value and, and paper does not. Uh, so currency is set aside 
outside the banking system. If you wanted to prepare, you would have some cash at the house in your jars or wherever you happen to like your, put your little stash. Another level, uh, since money is only paper, pe people save precious metal. Uh, they say about 10% of precious metal is, is where your entry level is, where you, that should be your goal. After that, it's up to you, but they say that 10% of your investable income should be in precious metal. And I get, I'm not preaching on money today, I'm just talking about prepping. But well, I watched this one show, so it's funny. Uh, it was a financial museum in Germany, and the video was about the museum. All the paper currencies were in the museum, all of them, as many as you can have, you know, from Rome, all, anywhere they could find them around the world. And they all were on the wall, and they weren't worth anything. They were all just paper. It's interesting. Every piece of paper that ever has been called money is wound up being worthless at some point in the currency's life. Then they got to the precious metals, and they showed all of them, and all the gold and all the silver were still worth the money, and the whole museum wasn't worth anything. All those currencies, all those years, but when they got to precious metals, they had value. And, uh, and he said, if you had a ship that was full of gold and it went down 300 years ago and they, they got it back out of the sea, it's still worth something. But if you had, 300, if you had cash in the, under the sea that long, it isn't worth anything. So there was an adjustment in, in my head, understanding that uh, if you, in prepping for that, you would, you would pre prepare to have metals. Then there's an, another level this, uh, this is just stuff for you to think about. This is expanding your imagination. I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm telling you how your brain has to work in stages so you can... How many of you knew you know you're smart, but you don't know what order to do things in sometimes? See, that's... It doesn't... Just because you don't know the order don't mean you don't know anything, but you have to learn the priorities of what's the most important, and you've got to be one... It's kind of like wanting to fix up your house before it's usable. Like, you can have a real pretty house, but a furnace is no good. You, you know, hot water tank's no good. You have an issue. You gotta, your priorities are wrong. You've got to work on the covering, the, the water, etc. right? So uh, what if you have to take flight? All of a sudden, you know, if you were in certain parts of the world, you might have to leave town and leave your house and all your prep stuff in it. You just might need a coat and some boots and uh, whatever you need to survive. Now, that might sound funny, but there's another, what I'm telling you is there's always another level of preparation if you're going to try to prepare for disasters. I'm not trying to teach you how to survive. I'm just using it as an example. But now we're going to talk about preparing your heart. I wanted to lay a natural progression so you could see that the natural mirrors the spiritual. Uh, man is a God-class being, you know that. I think that man is more complex than anything that's ever been made. The stuff that goes on in your body and in your mind and how your organs are, you've heard me say this, your kidney's this big, but when they want to put you on dialysis, you go in there and there's this huge machine and it, does, it takes all that equipment to do what one organ that God made can do. So obviously we're, we're extremely complex people. Um, after the fall, you know, man, man died. We, we all know that. He died spiritually, but how long did it take for Adam to die? A long time. He lived another 900 years at least. And I think that we get mixed up sometimes because we think delays mean nothing's going to happen. But if you cut the life source off of something, how many of you ever were digging and you cut a root and it took a long time for the thing to die that you cut the root on? Okay, those of you who are digging around know what I'm talking about. Once you cut the life supply off, it might have enough to live a while, but it's surely going to die. That's the way it was for Adam. The life, when he sinned, the life source was cut off. He was disconnected from God, which God is the giver of life. So just because he was living doesn't mean he wasn't dying. Interesting. So that was, and spiritual death came, and then the natural things uh, caught up with him. I'm going to give you an example. Hebrews 8, 5, if you would put that up there, please. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for cease, saith he, 
that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to him on the mountain. Your life is to be a type and shadow of heaven. Really, it is. Thy will be done like it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth like it is in heaven. So your life is to be a reflection of the heavenly principles. Is anybody sick in heaven? No. Is anybody broke in heaven? No. Does anybody get divorces in heaven? No. My point is, your life is to be a type and shadow of heaven. They, Jesus died to restore all of that to us. Now, the devil doesn't want you to have it, so his job is to make you think it's not true, and so he'll beat you up enough that you don't think it's true, so you won't bother, because he knows if you bother, you're going to have it. So your battle in your life to be a Christian is, is in your head 99% of the time. If he can vex you enough to make you think it won't work, you will live like, like it's not going to work. I hope this don't sound bad, but I can tell when somebody don't believe in me by the way they talk. I don't need to know anything else. I already know that they have a preconceived image that I'm never going to change or I can't do this or I can't do that. And they have to prove it. I have to prove it to them so they'll believe it. And I can tell you in the name of Jesus, I have never successfully proved that to anyone because that's not how it works. If you're waiting on somebody to prove you something so they'll change, you will surely be disappointed. Because they have to do it not to make you believe. Because it's not how it works. you got to believe in them. I really believe in believing the best about people. Do I watch myself because all people are not all sanctified up? Yes, I do. But I don't have to judge them to treat them with wisdom. There's a huge line of demarcation between wisdom and, and a bad prejudice against people. You know, when, when you go somewhere and you've never met someone, you use wisdom when you do business with them, don't you? But you don't treat them like they're a thief right up front, do you? At least I hope not. <laughs> 